Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our quarterly webinar series titled CIO's Corner, quarterly update with Chief Investment Officer Chris Gothier. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Jenna Santa Anna, and I'm the Relationship Manager for Stonehearth Capital Management. I've been with Stonehearth for seven years, and my primary role includes operations and supporting the advisors. I would like to start off with a few housekeeping items. On your GoToMeeting taskbar, you should see a section titled Questions. Please feel free to submit your questions throughout the course of the webinar. I'll be watching the questions as you ask Chris to answer questions as many, uh, he will try to answer as many as he can at the end of the webinar. If we run low on time or are unable to get to your question, Chris will reach out to you directly after the webinar to make sure we get your questions answered. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Chris Gothier is Stonehearts Chief Investment Officer, Chris brings more than 15 years of investment management experience to our firm, working with both institutional and individual investors. He is responsible for setting the firm's overall investment policy and strategy, including directing our asset allocation, investment risk, research, and portfolio management functions. Chris, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you, Jenna, for that beautiful introduction and very kind words. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Hopefully everyone is in a cool place, you know, staying as cool as they can during this little mini heat wave we're having here. Um, and before we start, we at Stonehearth really hope that everyone is staying as safe as possible and all families are healthy and happy as can be during this COVID pandemic. So as usual, we'll go in what we'll cover today. Chris, I think you just cut out there. I'm having problems hearing you. Can you hear me now, Jenna? Yes, there we go. Oh, if you sorry just about that. For today. <laughs> <laughs> Few technical difficulties there, I apologize. Um, the joys of working from home, um, all remote working. Um, so again, I would like to thank, thank you, Jenna, for that nice introduction. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. You know, hopefully everyone is staying as cool as they can during this little mini heat wave we're having. And before we start, you know, we at Stonehearth really hope everyone's staying safe and healthy during this COVID pandemic. Uh, so as usual, we're gonna go over a few different things today. We're gonna go what we're gonna cover today. First is asset class performance. You know, as we'll see, it's what a difference the Fed can make um, in one quarter. Um, we'll look at the investment environment, you know, definitely improving in terms of liquidity and support. Now we just need some economic activity and fundamentals to come along for the ride in order to keep the momentum up we're seeing in the marketplace. Um, then we'll close out with looking at some portfolio positioning. You know, how your portfolios are positioned to manage risk and take advantage of opportunities. And there are some out there in the marketplace. And in general, the story is be selective, but remain flexible. So I always like to start with our investment philosophy. And again, to me, this gives a nice framework for our discussion. It's how we view the markets, and it really helps to shed some light on our thought process that goes in to how we view your portfolios, and definitely leads to a better understanding of the conclusions we come to. So first, we believe in mean reversion. Trees do not grow to the sky. Uh, asset prices oscillate around the mean. Doesn't mean they go back to an average, but they go up and down around the mean. We do believe in valuation. Price definitely matters. What you pay for something drives returns. We also believe that expo exposure to core factors like value, momentum, quality do offer long-term excess returns above the market rate of return. Diversification is still the only free lunch in investing. And most importantly, we believe risk is not stationary, but fluctuates throughout the market cycle, and you must adjust risk as needed. So with that, let's take a look at asset class performance. You know, it's a nice rebound from Q1. In fact, it was the best quarter we've seen since 1998. And really what we saw is in looking at these asset class, we have light blue, which is the US market. Anything in green is overseas. Purple is fixed income. And anything in yellow is what we consider alternatives. So what we saw throughout the quarter is that the NASDAQ, which is led by the MAGA stocks, so whatever you call them Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, really led that higher, which was higher than small cap stocks, which was greater than US large cap, represented by the S&P 500, still a 20% return, which had a better return than international and EM, which is the 19 to 17% range, which did better than fixed income, 
and which did better than risk manage, which was kind of bringing up the rear here. We did see investors hedging their bets, you know, as precious metals from silver to gold had a great run in the quarter, up 28% for silver and almost 10% for gold. Um, so a really good quarter for that, but we did see some hedging. It's interesting to note here that given this tremendous support for the NASDAQ up 30%, it is the only index breaking out to new highs from the Q1 downturn. Um, that has a lot to do with the concentration, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. But really, the takeaway for me from the quarterly performance is that investors are really indicating a belief in the V-shaped recovery, or more bailouts for investors by the Fed, and Washington are on the way. Either way, you slice it, it was a very positive quarter for portfolios. Now, taking a longer view, we see a much more nuanced picture. Well, now here we're looking at the yearly performance still as of June 30th, 2020. Again, NASDAQ is still in the lead with a nice 33.5% return, but we're really starting to see a trifurcated market. And again, the trifurcated market means we're really broken up into three different return profiles for asset classes. The first one is the top three here, anything above a 20% return is we're looking at large crap growth, which is NASDAQ. Uh, again, think FAMAGA every time you hear NASDAQ, and we'll go through that. Long-term treasury, so long duration, and gold up 25%. So that's the first tier. So that's really was the best performance amongst all the asset classes. Then the second tier is the Fed-supported asset classes, and asset classes being supported by the big three. So again, think about the S&P 500, up a nice seven and a half percent, that's really being driven, and we'll show that in, in a future slide, by the NASDAQ. So a big piece of the NASDAQ is also a big piece of the S&P 500, so that's supporting it. The other tier is anything the Fed was buying. So corporate bonds, up 11%, convertibles, which are bonds with equity-like characteristics, but do well when corporate bonds do well, they're up 17%. So that's the tier two. Everything else is the tier three. So you can think about everything past the S&P 500 is pretty much everything else. Things that the Fed was not buying or just didn't perform well. So munis, the Fed's not buying. You look at international, EM, down three and a half, four percent But it's interesting. If you think about this EM and international, if you take the S&P 500, take out the FAMAGA stocks, you end up a return profile very similar to the emerging international. So again, this rally is not as broad-based as it looks at when you look at the headline numbers. You know, so we look at the overall performance. NASDAQ, along with the treasuries and gold, are getting the most attention from investors, which was better than bonds, at least the ones the feds are buying, which was better than large cap US, better than international, and small cap bringing up the rear. So overall, given what the economy has been through with the COVID, the economy slowly closing, then shutting down, then slowly reopening, Performance has held up reasonably well. And again, a lot of this was just due to the massive amount of support being provided by governments across the globe, which we'll look into a little bit. So before we, we look into the concentration, I wanna look at factors. So again, one of our big beliefs is factors. So what we're looking at here is the value factor, things that are trading cheaply, quality, momentum, yield, and the black line, the S&P. So momentum, think about momentum, lots of FAMAGA in there. That was the only factor to beat to best the broad indices. It was up 23% during the quarter, you know, compared to the 20% rise in S&P. Value stocks, including the dividend down 15 and 12, brought up the rear. I and mean, you see value and dividend stocks, you think financials, industrials, things are really impacted by the COVID. So we did see a, a peak, you know, at the beginning of June, as, and then we saw the markets retreat as a resurgence of COVID came through and the fears. But in general, since that peak, we've really been trading in a basically a 300 point trading range. And we'll go into a little bit more detail when we look at the technical aspects of the marketplace right now. So I mentioned about the concentration. Um, and really before moving on to the current investment environment, I wanted to take a look at the breadth or really lack thereof in market performance. So this is a chart done by Y charts. And what we're looking at here is the S&P 500. There's actually 505 companies in there as of July 3rd. When you take the top 10 by company size and the top 50, you get a top 10, 9.5% return year to date as of July 3rd. You take the next 50, or next 40, I should say, and you get 2.4% return. Once you get below those top 60 companies, every other asset class in the S&P 500 or equity in the S&P 500 has a negative return on average. Again, there's some in there that are positive, but on average, if the average, the 100 first, 150 stock earned a negative 
the 350 to 400s by market cap earned a negative 17. That's why we saw the small cap underperform. So again, it really was a concentrated equity performance from a handful of perceived winners which dominated the market performance. Again, the FAMAGA, the Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, Google. The takeaway, if you put the numbers together, 90% of the S&P 500 index as of July 3rd is actually lower on the year. So again, it's not as broad based as the headline indices would suggest. Taking a longer look at the S&P 500 index in a historical perspective, we're looking at here a historical chart going back to 96. We see the peaks at certain times um, throughout history. You can see the tech bubble, the great financial crisis, and where we are in the current marketplace. It's a nice little chart up here, so you can kind of compare where we have been to where we are now. So where we are now compared to previous peaks in the market. Look, the PE ratio back in the in tech bubble at 27, a little bit lower at 16, the great financial crisis, but back in February before everything hit at 19, which is higher than average. Right now, we're at 21. So again, a little bit high. If we look at the dividend yield. It's pretty similar to previous market peaks, so nothing outrageous. Once we get to the 10-year treasury, now we start to see the big difference compared to this peak compared to previous. Back in the, um, the tech bubble, you could actually earn 6% risk-free from the government. Back in the great financial crisis, before they lowered rates, you could earn almost 5%. Even back in February, you could earn 1.5%. Right now, you earn 0.7, which doesn't even keep up with inflation. So by even investing in the 10-year treasury, you're probably not going to end up keeping up with in, in, inflation. So again, looking at this, you can see the Fed, the Fed intervention across the complex here. You know, Really what they're doing is a lack of safe return due to lower yields. It really is an attempt by the Fed to drive investors out the risk curve, so think equity, which increases demand for equities. Simple economics, increased demand causes prices to rise, which makes asset classes like equities more expensive as investors are willing to pay more due to lack of alternatives. Really being the only game in town to generate any kind of return. And again, a good historical quotation to remember is, valuations don't matter when a bubble is inflating inflating, but they do matter when it is deflating. And right now we're seeing an inflation of a bubble and being driven by Fed intervention. So let's take a look at the fundamentals of the S&P 500, where it stands. Look at traditional fundamental metrics, looking at PE ratio, which is just the price over the next 12 months expected earnings. So what analysts think the S&P is gonna earn, not what they've earned. Over here on the right, we're looking at price to book. Again, what's on company's balance sheets compared to the current price in the marketplace. Return on equity, think about how much money they're making for each dollar invested in the company. And the dividend yield is just how much income they're paying out to investors given the current price. You know, looking across in the complex of all these fundamentals, you can look throughout history going back to 05, they're pretty much the most expensive at all time highs. You know, and even though forward earnings are a little bit more unpredictable than usual, these valuations still show stocks at all time highs. So again, current fundamentals and price need to catch up to the price action we're seeing. So thinking about earnings, let's take a look at these earnings. So what we're looking at here is expectations for earnings from Goldman Sachs. But again, we look at multiple companies, we look at multiple ways to look at earnings, we do our own earnings expectations. They all come up to pretty much the same or right around the same. So again, this is a good representation of expectations and the most realistic ones you're gonna get when you look at everything. Look at the S&P 500 earnings per share, 2019. So they earned $165 per share. That translates at a market price of 31.52, which is the close yesterday, or a little bit under the close of yesterday, 19 times those earnings. So again, what that means is you're paying $19 for every $1 of earnings that the S&P generates. It's a way to, gen to understand how expensive the market is trading. We look at 2020, as expected, going down to 110, you see a big 30% drop. That would put the market at the next 12 months earnings at 28 times. So from the previous chart, that's kind of at the, one of the all time highs we've seen in the PE ratio. And what we're seeing a lot in the marketplace is people really going out to 2021, which has never happened in the past, going out two years to justify valuations. So you can see analysts at least are expecting a nice bounce back in the S&P 500 to 170, which is even greater than we saw in 2000. 2019 and represents 55 percent growth even if we reach these lofty expectations and, and they are lofty they are expecting a lot for the companies here it does still equal 18 times 
So again, still trading expen expensive, even if they just meet expectations. Um, so trading very rich, you know, given the economic uncertainty. I think the major question will be answered very shortly as companies are just beginning to report Q2 here. Um, so over the next week or so, you know, earnings, especially the guidance, right? We really want to see what they're guiding to, not what they've reported. We know it's going to be bad, as we can see in 2020, but what their comments are about this 170, and they, do they think they can make it? Does this go up or down over the next couple of weeks here? Will really tell us a lot about the new direction of the equity market. You know, but the takeaway is investors are really expecting an awful lot from companies, you know, heavy lifting from these companies over the next two years to justify the current prices. So expanding our horizons and looking at the global earnings a little bit, we don't have the same data like we do on domestic earnings. So what we're looking at here is S&P 500 in blue, the international, think about developed markets, think Europe, think Japan, and emerging markets in gold here. And these are growth rates. So these aren't point estimates, these are gr growth rates. You can see emerging markets consistently have higher growth rates, which is one reason why we've, we've historically liked EM. They have higher growth rates and they're trading it cheaper. And you can see that everything declined as expected, but EM declined a lot less given the higher growth rates in the past. And even when we look at downgrades and upgrades, and EM is being downgraded, they're being downgraded a lot less than um, the, the more developed parts of the world. So again, one reason why EM may be a good addition to portfolios is you have some better earnings growth, less negative to the downside, and it's trading at cheaper multiples than it has historically. So again, it is a global phenomenon that earnings are coming down across the board, but there are pockets where they're not coming down as much or as fast, or prices haven't risen as much um, to account for that. So let's try to turn the fixed income land now, and we're going to start with the yield curve and try to find the signal through the noise. So this is a traditional yield curve, and basically it's what you can earn in treasuries from one month all the way out to 30 years. The current yield curve is in blue, which is right here. Last quarter, gold, right here. And beginning coming into this year, this is turquoise or aqua green. Not really sure what color that is. Um, but again, massive jump down from the beginning of the year. But during the quarter, we didn't see a lot of movement. Um, it was pretty uneventful. We did see some slightly flattening of the curve as the long end of the curve declined. And you see that right here, it went from 1.3 to 1.4. So a little bit, 0.7 to 0.6 right here, I'm sorry. The 10 year declined a little bit. So a little bit of a slightly of a flattening, but all in all, a very uneventful month. Um, but again, uneventful sometimes gives you clues and you're looking for the signal to the noise, you know, this is a little bit noteworthy. Against the backdrop of all the hyperactivity we saw in equity land, the positive um, sentiment we saw, you would expect this curve to be steepening given the equity performance, you know, at least moving somewhere, confirming what the equity market is seeing. Because Historically, what you've seen is when equity, equity markets do well, they expect economic activity to continue and they see economic growth. And when you see economic growth, and expansions, you see a steepening yield curve, and we're just not seeing that yet. So again, it's just some divergence to kind of keep in mind when we're looking at the overall market picture and trying to find the signal to the noise. So keeping on fundamentals, we're gonna look at yield and duration. So what we're looking at here is one-year returns in gold, but different fixed income products, leveraged loans, high yields. Over here, you have broad corporate bonds, broad and treasuries. This green is duration. You can think of duration as the amount of risk due to rates rising. So the higher duration, the worse the return when rates rise to these asset classes. And we can see from, the, from this chart, long duration sectors, things that have high duration, have performed very well. But it does come as a, at a cost because it has eroded any yield in the marketplace. And this yield is represented by the blue. You can see long-term broad treasuries, not a lot of yield. Even corporates going up the risk curve, not a lot of yield. Where the Fed has intervened is where you're seeing all the yield, high yield, leveraged loans. So again, when we think about this, and we can break the chart into two pieces, we think about what the Fed can buy and what it can't buy, it's the cutoff is right here. And you can clearly see the difference in the asset classes. They cannot buy EM, they're not buying floating rates, not buying high yields and leveraged loans. Everything over here is eligible for Fed purchase. And you can see the difference in performance. So again, the Fed intervention is helping prop up the market and helping stave off a bigger disaster. So we can see the asset classes being bought by the Fed are really being bid up. So last chart on fixed income on the fundamentals is we're gonna look at the spread. And when you think about spread, what you have to think about is 
everybody can earn the, the risk-free rate. So the treasuries are the risk-free rate. If I'm a corporation and I want to borrow money, I go out to the marketplace, they're going to charge me a price over and above the risk-free rate. So the higher the spread, the more risky they think I am or the more valuation support I have, the cheaper they're, the cheaper they're trading. So in terms of comparing it to equity world, the cheaper PE would be a higher spread in fixed income land. And the higher PE would be a lower spread. So fixed income would be considered trading expensive when these dots are below the averages or at the averages. And they're all currently, again, the asset classes the Fed are buying are at the averages. Look over here, ones that the Fed has not intervened, you can see the spreads are still wider than they have been historically. They're still pricing in risk a little bit more than this because they don't have that Fed backstop in place. Um, you know, so again, across the board, spreads are higher than historical averages, but not really high enough, in my opinion, given the potential economic environment we're in. We have really seen the beginning stages of a new bankruptcy cycle. You've seen some companies start to go bankrupt. You see a few more talking about it. And the market really is not separating the winners and losers. And it really is due to this Fed backstop. Investors are indiscriminately buying asset classes. But there are some pockets of opportunity, like I talked about before. You know, we look at the high yield over here with this nice spread. Um, support here average of 469 currently at 644 that takes into account potential bankruptcies and gives you some nice valuation and some nice income so again fixed income we recently added to in our portfolios because we like the risk return profile that asset class given how wide the spreads are right now that kind of sums up where we've been and what we're looking at in terms of financial markets in terms of equities and fixed income we talked a lot about the support or stimulus whichever you want to choose your adjective on that. So we really want to take a deeper dive into the support that's being provided. And the first one is fiscal support. So when, when anytime you see fiscal, think government, think Congress, think president, it's fiscal. So what we're looking at here is, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this, this is support that the government provided back in March. Again, it was the $1,200 check per adult, hope everyone got their check or at least a piece of it, and $500 per child. We had the extra added unemployment benefits, you know, had some pay line, paycheck protection programs, small business relief, all that adds up to a cost. And that cost or stimulus was two and a half trillion, which numbers get thrown around. And once you start putting T's in front of T's in front of numbers, they lose all meaning. So we like to use percentages. So it's almost 12% of total gross domestic product. Everything the economy produced last year, we, the government provided almost 12% stimulus, which is just amazing. But it does come at a cost. And we can clearly see the charts on the left, the trajectory is not good. So we're looking up here at the top chart, federal budget surplus deficit. So how much the, the government's losing. And you can see that it has been up there about 8% back in the great financial crisis, coming down as the economy rebounded. Went into 2020 at about 4.6% negative, which is fine. Then we see this massive jump up. 18%, which is this. And even though we do see the fall off, these are projections and they don't fall off back to these lower levels. We're still running at a much higher rate. And again, these are baseline projections. They do not include any recession for the next 10 years, which is kind of hard to fathom. So again, this is based on everything staying as is and still having an economic rebound. We look at the total amount of debt that the US is accumulating, which is right here. This is again, percent of GDP. We were up at 100% of GDP back um, they're in the, after the war. We've never been there since. We're going to hit that in 2020 based on current projections. We're right here at 79.2 and we're going up there. So again, unprecedented amount of stimulus, um, but does come as a cost. So with all this debt being issued to pay for the stimulus, it does, debt does pull demand forward. So it accomplishes its goal. It stays off economic catastrophe by forcing demand on people. But the cost of that is you do forego future economic activity. As the bills accrue, someone has to pay for this. Today, they need to be repaid. So growth may be a little bit challenged moving forward with all this debt hanging out there. And this stimulus is not just a US phenomenon. It really is a global effort. And we expand the horizon to look out the world. And what we're looking at here is, again, Turkey, Mexico, India, France, all the countries know they're all doing their part to save their economies as well, providing support where needed. You know, in this chart, is interesting to me is Germany right here. You know, even usually frugal Germany, who's always loath to spend any amount of money, almost 10% of the GDP is going to providing support. So again, lost lots of massive support from governments across the world 
due to the in response to the COVID crisis. So turning away from government support to and fiscal to more monetary support or central bank support. Although, and some and yours included, we classify the current central bank as a branch of the government and not independent, but technically they are independent. We can see they are doing their part as well to provide support to the economy. So what we're looking at here is the Fed funds rate. So this is what you usually hear quoted when they say the Fed announced the lowering rates, raising rates. This is the low end of the curve and this is what they control. And you can see up there at 6%, you can never imagine that after come, coming out of the tech bubble, coming in lower for the great financial crisis. You see the taper tantrum right here back in 18, 2019, back to zero. So again, very low, not out of precedence. We had this for the great financial crisis for a long time. But again, they're doing their best to make it cheaper to borrow money for corporations. And this is really the first leg of sub Fed support. And they have indicated they are willing to keep rates lower for longer. And so far, they've done what they said they were going to do. And uh, that's a very unique proposition given what you come up, comes out of Washington. So it's nice to see they're actually doing what they say they're going to do. They also have a second quiver in their arrow. And what it is, is QE. So again, this is purchasing, direct purchase of assets. This is purchasing corporate bonds, cor pur pur purchasing mortgage-backed securities in the marketplace to help uh, provide liquidity for companies. So again, what this is doing is look at the Fed balance sheet over time. You know, and again, this is an attempt to keep good companies solvent, but really what they're doing is using a bazooka. They're not differentiating between companies. And rather than a sniper rifle, the Fed is causing unintended consequences by keeping everything afloat. It can't last forever. So again, what they're going is indiscriminately just buying asset, buying treasuries, buying MBS, buying other, which is corporate bonds. And you can see back in, it's running at under 1 trillion. Response to great financial crisis, you know, Looking at this chart, the big bump up from the 09 and not, not seeing the decline. Remember, this was a very robust economic period in the US and good for asset prices. And we did not see the Fed's balance sheet decline. So it clearly have a problem. We can see this increase coming from the COVID too. So as the COVID crisis hit, we had a nice bump up and we're not forecasting for the balance sheet to contract at any time. So again, it looks like the same thing that we saw in 09, a permanently higher Fed balance sheet is gonna be here for a while. Because anytime, like we saw in the temperature tantrum, as the Fed, how can they exit these positions without causing market disruptions and how that's going to look? So again, lower for longer, the Fed is intervening in the market at a much higher plateau for much longer than expected. Can the Fed continue to do this? Well, in the short term, yes. Because remember, the Fed has a dual mandate. One, full employment, and as we'll show in a few charts following this, that we're nowhere near full employment and inflation. And the way they judge inflation is a core CPI. Historically, over the past 50 years, it's been running at a little under 4%. It's currently, as of May 2020, running at 1.2, how the Fed defines core CPI. And we can talk about how they define it till the cows come home. But again, this is how the Fed looks at it. They don't see inflation. And they're judging too hot inflation at 2%, but they've also mentioned that they're willing to be flexible with that 2%. So the takeaway here is given the dual mandate, full employment, which is not out there, control inflation, we actually control prices, which they define as inflation, there's no reason for them and no impetus for them to raise rates anytime soon. So they can hold this lower for longer given what we're seeing in the data. So the big takeaway is lower for longer by the Fed and watch what they say. So like fiscal support, this is also a global phenomenon. It's not just the US. It truly is a global effort to lift up the entire marketplace. And we look at central bank support over here again. This is bank bond purchases in billions. We got the Fed right here, but BOJ is Bank of Japan, ECB is European Bank, BOE is Bank of England. And you can see all going in the same direction up and to the right. They're buying assets. And again, they're doing their pop. I, lowering rates too. And we look over here in 2020, there's on very, very few hikes and more cuts than anything. So again, bond purchases by central banks show no signs of slowing and there's nary a rate hike in sight from over here. We expect this future support to continue and it will provide some nice buffer for equity prices. Now it's not the only game in town and there are other forces at work, but again, it's a positive influence for equity markets going forward. So turning away from support and seeing what this is actually accomplishing, you know, 
it's one thing to say we're providing all the support, but what's it actually doing to the economic activity? What's it doing to the consumer? How are they reacting to this support? How are the markets, we knew how the markets are reacting, but how's the economy reacting? So I like to look at the, what I call the big four, and they are employment in blue, industrial production in purple, sales in green, and income in red. Um, real incomes reported with the big lags, we don't have June numbers, but again, just a quick look by a cursory look, you can see everything's improving. Looking at a longer term chart, which is normalized to come out of the great financial crisis at zero, you can see nice growth, impact of COVID right here, and a nice rebound. You, know, you clearly see the bounce from the lows as the pent up demand took off as the economy slowly reopened. And in fact, if you look at sales by this green line here, you can kind of do it right here, it's actually back to its current run rate. So it's recovered everything it lost during the COVID crisis. Um, we do have to be a little bit resident with this data because the pace and nature of the recovery remains more uncertain than usual due to the nature of the COVID virus. It is very hard to predict how it's gonna be transmitted from person to person, state to state. It's, very, it's a little bit easier to understand economic activity, um, former recessions, things we've seen in the past. We really haven't seen a pandemic of this nature given this amount of support and this free trading equity market. So again, we're in kind of a unique circumstance, but it's nice to see the data trending in the right way. And we just need to see this growth to continue to justify the current prices and not just have this be a rebound from the demand shock of the COVID induced economic slow sh shutdown. I really wanna take a step back and look at the employment more closely because it is part of the Fed's dual mandate. So what we're looking at here is historical recessions since post-World War II, percent job losses. And I've shown this chart before, and we can see that previous recessions usually bottomed at 5% um, job losses and then rebounded very sharply within two to three years. We saw the 07, which we've talked about before in previous calls, really was different. It was a lot deeper, right? So it's down almost 6% and it took a lot longer to recover, but we did recover. So again, we're heading in the right direction. Just a quick look, you can see how different this is, this COVID uh, impact to the economy. And this is massive, almost 15% job losses. And you do see, again, jobs are improving. You see this massive rebound over here, paycheck protection program, um, unemployment benefits, things that are helping companies survive and it bounce back. But you can see that even with this huge bounce back, we're still 10% below where we started. Now, hopefully we see this trajectory keep going up and we see a nice V-shaped recovery. And that's what really the, equity markets are expecting. The fixed income tends not to believe because we're not seeing those rates rise. But again, at least now we it's moving in the right direction. We just need to see this continue forward to get too much more excited about the equity markets. So taking a step back and look at the global economic activity, what we're looking at here is purchases managers index. It's a diffusion index um, from across the globe. You can see US, the developed world, think Euro, Germany, France, and then emerging markets, Brazil, Mexico. You can see the expansions in the late 2000, 2015, 16, you know, nice expansion and COVID impact. Um, China's the only one that's still in the green and it is China, so you do have to be wary of the data. Um, it is a command control economy. Um, but again, all in all, there's only one country that really looks at an expansion here. And that is kind of troubling because if you look at this chart as a whole and it looks at the entire manufacturing base, 90% is in a contraction mode right now. There really is no precedent for this. You know, there's no region that's expanding other than China that can really provide some ballast in the stormy sea. Um, so it really is a challenging environment. Now, hopefully the support comes through, we see this V-shaped recovery and we can go on that right path, but at least for now, the, the historical economic data is not pointing to a very rosy picture. So I want to take a look at some real-time up-to-date data. Since this data we've looked at before is really lagged for reporting purposes, right? We're reporting on Q1, reporting on um, May's data, you know, and really when you look at the real-time data that's out there, it really depends, the interpretation is really depends on are you a glass half full person or a glass who's, or a half empty type of person. And what we're looking here is a new data set from Jefferies. Um, it's a U.S. Economic Activity Index. And what it attempts to do is understand how much real, real activity is going on compared to historical. So it's an amalgamation of real-time data 
it's traffic congestion. So how cars are moving through tolls and things like that. Public transportation trends, how you often you swipe your Charlie card. Um, it's not just Charlie cards, it's just the one I know in Boston. Others have their cards too. Um, domestic flight activity, you get the data from the TSA now. Um, electricity consumption, new job postings. All this data gives you a really good insight into what's happening on the ground right now. And what they've done, they've normalized it to 100 before the crisis back in January. So anytime you see 100, you're at a normalized economic activity level compared to history. So again, you can see the big fall off as COVID rears its ugly head and we started to slowly shut down. You know, the clear drop off in March as we closed the economy. And then we saw the rebound from the bottom in April. Again, as the economy started to slowly reopen the economy to the current flattening of the data. You can see that's a little bit concerning right now where this growth rate has slowed and at least the, this real time data is flattening a little bit. So the other one I wanna look at is, and again, I'll preface this with, in case you need another reason to be worried about Big Brother, um, we're gonna take a look at foot traffic gleaned from cell phone data being pinged by phone companies. So the basic way to look at this is, if you have your phone on and you leave your house, you get pinged by a cell tower. If you go a mile, it gets pinged by another cell tower and so on and so on, and phone companies can track that. Not you individually, but they track the overall data. So what this is telling is how much people are moving around. Where are people going? Are they staying in? Are they staying out? So what this is, is a percent of population going out. And the percent of population is not the entire population, it's the percent of population that has a cell phone on. So 75% of the people before the COVID crisis were going out. You see up here, hyped a little bit 76. And then you see the big fall off like the other data and you see the rebound again in April as we start to see a recovery and the economy still slowly reopen. And again, unfortunately, what we're seeing here is this flatlining. So again, looking at the real-time data, putting it all together, it really seems to be stalling after bouncing off the recent bottom. You know, again, that bounce really was this burst of activity from pent up demand. People wanted to spend something right away, but we really need to see that follow through, that increased demand, that incremental spending, not just buying what I haven't bought in the past month, but going out and buying those new things, buying another car, buying a house. Um, we really need to see that keep going. So I wanna take a quick comment on the upcoming election. Um, and no one's much talking about this and it's interesting to me. And you know, I think about this a lot and when I think about investors in the current markets, I mean, markets are really like children. They have a very limited attention span and they have lacked the ability to focus on more than one thing at a time. So as they're thinking about stimulus and they're thinking about COVID, they kind of forget this, the world's still moving. Things are still happening. And we do have an election coming up and there has been some big changes since COVID reared its ugly head to the election um, front. So what we're looking here is probability from predicted, again, about who's gonna win the election. So we look up here, the blue line, this is the house, no surprises there, always expect it to remain democratic and still does today at 83%. The president, you know, started off at 60% back in February. You can see the hit from the virus, nice little rebound, flatlining. Again, what this means is there's a 60% chance based on predict.org that the democratics candidate could win the presidency. So again, if it's increasing, that means the Democrats are more likely to take that. The big one to me is the Senate. And this has always been a safe Republican, didn't think it was gonna turn until recently. And again, you can see it now where there really is a decent chance, you know, and people are thinking the 60% chance that the Senate could turn Democratic. Why does this matter? It does matter. Um, for markets, because again, trying to find the signal to the noise, this could change in current environment. It's not so much Democratic or Republican, is that you're going from a divided government to a one-party government. A one-party government is more apt to enact legislation because they've greater control. Now, there's still checks and balances, this still a filibuster, which can kind of prevent too much legislation, but you're more apt to have some legislation passed. And again, trying to find the signal to the noise, think about all the legislation that has been passed over the past three years and what happens to that legislation tax cuts for example um, if there's a new party in place so again it's just something to be wary of um, that one party government is more apt to be more interactive with the economy um, both good and bad so let's turn to expected returns um, we like to use research affiliates they're one of the providers we use. We also use Ned Davis, one of our partners. We do some of our own internal calculations, um, but Research Affiliates really has a good handle uh, in terms of what our philosophy is, in terms of valuation support, providing asset prices. And what they do is they look out over 10 years and calculate expected returns. Now, again, these are expected returns. They're not set in stone, but it gives you a good idea of the investment landscape. What are we expecting for returns over the next 10 years? 
and we're looking at this chart, we have real expected returns going up. And then over here, we have volatility. So how much volatility are expected to achieve those returns, you know, up and down price movements? And you can see up here, one reason why we like EM equity, it has some of the highest expected returns. But again, you don't want to go 100% EM equity because some has the highest expected volatility and is more likely than not to meet on, to not be at this point, to be, have a nice random. Again, more volatility, greater chance, confidence interval around this return. International, right there, again, 5% return, US small, we can kind of go through all of these. You can see there's not a lot of love. When we look at the bonds in blue, uh, most of them are negative to zero. And even if you look at the 60-40 traditional, again, this is that 60-40 portfolio, not really expecting robust returns. In fact, they actually have it flat with the 9% volatility. Again, just a point in time. But looking at all these and taking it together and trying to find the signal to the noise, I mean, the takeaway for me is, I mean, there's gonna be modest returns. You know, there's no guarantee that this is going to be seven or 10, if I, but again, looking at very modest returns to all asset classes, and we really continue, given this environment, to see the benefits of being flexible and taking advantage of temporary dislocations in asset classes to generate return. Again, be cautious of what you invest in, but also be nimble, be flexible, be willing to change as the data dictates. Now we're gonna turn to our model. It's our Stonehearth Capital Market Risk Model. We also use a model from our friends at Ned Davis. And what we look at here is a four stool model. We look at the technical picture. Again, a lot to do with price, structure, reversion. You know, bull markets are led by strong investor sentiment, a lot of price action. We look at valuation, you know, what you pay for something matters. We look at the current economic environment. And we also look at it from a qualitative um, framework. So again, as expected, given the price action we saw, Improvement across the board in our technical indicators as they switch from a negative to a positive in the quarter. So we, as we talked about last quarter, we saw a negative across the board, a negative five, and we're actually at a positive three now. So again, big change as expected. We saw lots of price movement, um, positive price action across the board, and we'll take a little bit deeper dive into that in the next chart. Moving to valuations, decreased by two, really driven by the uh, yield indicator, whereas the prices went up. Dividends didn't keep up with the price, so we got a little bit more negative on that. Um, it does remain, valuations do remain a long-term concern. Um, as they turn a little bit more negative in the quarter. But again, never been a good timing tool. But again, just balance that with the technical pictures showing so positive, we have some negative indications from the valuation front. Looking at the economic data, best described as stable, but still pointing to a negative outlook. It declined by one based on manufacturing index, but again, still pointing to a a little bit cloudy environment economic picture. We saw seeing some pickups, but like we saw in the data again, we're not looking for a rebound off the bottom. We're looking for a rebound and then grow to, to newer heights. And just, we haven't seen that yet. And yet the key word, we're on the right path. We just need to see that keep growing. And the qualitative we changed, we went from a negative to a neutral. And we really increased our, our outlook to neutral as we're trying to balance the accommodating Fed with a potential resurgence in the COVID outbreak and the potential political uncertainty surrounding the upcoming election. And we really didn't want to fight the Fed too much because you can see the impact they've had on markets and the lower for longer. So as you look at this model, we went from a negative nine at the overall to a negative three. So again, we're not back in bull market, we're not ba back in positive, but all in all, we saw big improvements from the depths of March, but we're still waiting for confirmation that we are on the path to expansion and not just in a recovery phase. We really need to see that expansion. And that's really what we're looking for on this model is to have it move from recovery to expansion to get more excited about the marketplace. So taking a deeper dive in the technical picture, you know, I always go, history doesn't rhyme, but it often repeats. So we use historical averages, price movements, moving averages, places before price, move, price points before that had impacts to judge indications try to find the signal to the noise into what future price holds. Now this is as of June 30th, so I do know we broke through this. We're up at 32 something today, I believe, but as of June 30th, we're at 3,100. What we're looking at here is historical S&P. We're looking at moving averages, 50 week moving average, 200 week moving average, and what we're looking for is support and resistance. We know through time that these act as places of war, you know, where markets fight to move higher or lower. And you can see provide support, providing some resistance, and you can see during the COVID crisis, shot right through. But again, we saw this massive recovery. So went through those moving averages, recovered, recovered key Fibonacci levels. And again, these are retracement levels based on the golden ratio. And we can go through how they're calculated. But in the end, 
every technician uses these, so they do matter because it becomes a self-reinforcing loop. So these do matter to the prices. But we can see we talked about that channel we talked about earlier in the when we talked about asset class performance. It really has been a point range, some 2,970, call it right around there, you know, right around here, up until 323. Up there. So again, we're still in this trading range, at least as of June 30th. Um, and we're really what we're seeing is we want to see this break upwards um, or low. I mean, we don't want to see it break lower, but again, breaking lower or higher will give us an indication of which way the market moves next. And as of right now, we're seeing it kind of testing this upward bound and we'd like to see it continue further. So again, this is why we look at the technical picture and we see it getting a little bit more positive. We saw this nice bounce back, recovered some moving averages, and we're in a cons what we call a consolidation phase, this channel and looking for a breakout to the upside. We look at the RSI, which is just basically an indicator seeing, is it overbought? Are we going, are we, did we go up too far too fast? And again, when it's above 70, we get nervous, not above 70. I'm um, not a screaming buy, but you know, not negative. And we look at a MACD, um, for those who don't know, which is a moving average convergence divergence. You're looking at a shorter term moving average compared to a longer term moving average. Net, net, you like when the black line goes upward to the red line, that means it's positive for future price performance. So again, technical pictures looking very healthy, but not all the technical pictures looking healthy, So, which is keeping us from going more positive on our model. There are some divergences. And the big one for me is that lack of breadth we talked about. We talked about the FAMAGA stocks. Another way to look at breadth in the marketplace is the percent of stocks above the 200 day moving average. So how many stocks are participating in the current rally? Again, historically, you know, Rallies have been strongest when they're broad based, weakest when they're supported by small and very concentrated. You know, the bull market is the weakest when, when the support is very narrow. Doesn't mean it changes, it just means that right now support is very narrow. And what we're looking at here, historically, we'd like to see it above this moving average, which means 46% of the companies are above the 200. Right now, only 30. So again, we saw a nice bounce off the bottom. We need to see this continue to move up and reclaim this line before we get a lot more positive from a technical standpoint. So again, there are some divergences. It's not all positive, but technicals are looking very well. Looking at our portfolio positioning, um, during the quarter, you know, we did do some portfolio positioning changes. We increased our U.S. equity exposure, ranging from six to 15 percent, depending on the risk level, uh, if conservative, moderate, aggressive. Um, and we really did that on the back of an improving technical picture, like we saw. But we do remain un underweight. So again, we still underweight. We just close that underweight because we are in unshattered territory. We did add to particular pieces of the U.S. market. We did like momentum, so we added to some positive momentum stocks, stocks that are having positive price trends, and we added to the small cap space, which should rebound nicely as the economy keeps recovery from here. If this recovery keeps moving on, we really funded that with our alternative exposure, which we moved from an overweight to a neutral really on the back that just wasn't performing as expected during the downturn. So we, we thought it was time to trim that and move in to more to close the U.S. equity underweight. Like we talked about, we added to high yield, declining portfolios. It was trading at attractive yields compared to the rest of the fixed income market. We did that, add an allocation to precious metals. You know, we liked that as a hedge to the potential unlimited money printing and the Fed lower for longer. So it provides some nice returns there. Um, we do remain overweight cash. So cash is one of our big overweights here. And we want to have this overweight because we want to take advantage of opportunities like we talked about. We really think that there's this marketplace with the COVID, with the Fed intervention is going to pre present opportunities for those willing and able to take advantage of it. And having a little cash on the sidelines lets us and allows us, affords us the fact that we can actually do that. So looking at the portfolio in general, we still remain underweight equities given the uncertainty in the economic rebound. We're looking to, to increase that, hopefully, if the, market, if the economy keeps um, expansion, but we're just not there yet. We still like emerging markets. We saw they're getting less downgrades um, on the earnings side. Earnings are being lowered less, and they have much greater valuation support. We still think you should remain overweight fixed income, but again, the right parts of fixed income, we liked high yield. We don't like going out the curve. We'd rather stay in the middle of the curve to shorter. Again, we just don't think you're being rewarded for moving out the risk space and have a little cash on hand to take advantage of some opportunities as they present themselves and have still some alternatives. Again, some gold, some precious metals, um, maybe some risk managed products in there to manage the expected increase in volatility. So again, summing up our thinking, where we stand in all this, you know, proper risk level is always key. You know, having some exposures to equities is good um, or risk assets, but you don't want to be a hero in this. And you really want to maintain your flexibility and ability to adjust your portfolio 
as the data comes in because as we're seeing markets move much more quickly than they have in the past as this data is being reported and given the uncharted territory of COVID we're not really sure how the virus is going to play out but you have to stand ready and able to act on it. So with that I'll talk about my final thoughts before we move into the question and answer period. You know, massive amount of fiscal and monetary support is keeping markets afloat. Um, government support programs will need to be renewed very soon. We didn't talk about it, but it's coming due July. Um, there is talk, the Republicans came out with a $1 trillion plan, the Democrats came out with a $3.5 trillion plan, so they'll probably end up at a $2 trillion plan, but it's not guaranteed, and a lot of these things start to begin to roll off in July, so they need to be renewed, so that is a risk out there. Uh, we're seeing economic improvement across the board, but really not enough to tip the scales yet to say that we're, we're past, we're all clear, give the all clear sign. Um, don't forget about the upcoming election. It will matter to equity prices. And the big question is, do we continue to reopen the economy or roll back due to resurgence in COVID? That can't be modeled. You just have to constantly watch the data and see what's happening on the ground. Um, the status of a vaccine you know, could change the market picture very drastically, but it's very unpredictable and there's really no way to model the, st the status of a vaccine. You just have to be prepared to act on it. And as always, trade carefully and stay nimble. There's the appendix, compliance, and quickly read that. And now I'll turn it over to Jennifer if there's any questions in the queue. Okay, great, Chris. Thank you for all that information today. And we do have a few questions uh, and we do have some time. So let me um, jump in. Um, so in simple terms, what is driving the market? It just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> good question. <laughs> um, it's a really good question. You know, it's something I think about constantly trying to figure out, you know, what's going on in the marketplace and then trying to narrow that down to something that people can understand. You know, it, it, it's really a challenge to boil down the decisions made by millions of independent investors to really one underlying theme, but I'll give it a shot. You know, I, I do think this rally is really continued faith um, by investors that no matter what happens, the Fed and slash government will continue to provide support. I mean, the alternative is just too painful, right? I mean, not providing support, we saw the temper tantrum. You know, recent history gives precedence to this, right? You know, going back to March, going back to the global financial crisis. We've always seen support come in every time markets have wobbled. Um, so in short, either you get you know, economic recovery, which is good for stocks and stocks do well, or you get another downturn and the Fed will step in and provide support and will bail out investors again. You know, this really implies there's no risk in the, in the markets. So investors are keep willing to pay a higher and higher prices. It's really based on hope, you know, and Really, history shows that hope is never a good long-term investment strategy, but can sometimes produce good returns in the short term. But in the long run, fundamentals are still the biggest driver of stock returns. And I understand the people who want to bet on this moral hazard, bet on the Fed backstop, but I'm not so sure it's the best way to invest your entire portfolio. I would rather best I would rather invest based on fundamentals. So again, in the long run, it's just hope that the bailouts from the government will continue. So hopefully that answers your question as simply as possible. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And then um, why wouldn't Washington want to renew their support programs? Yeah, I know. It, I mean, it seems easy, you know, and I, I thought about this a lot and, you know, I did say that there's a good chance, but again, it really seems easy, but history shows nothing is easy when you have a two party system of government, you know, and really they're watching one screen, but seeing two different movies. So again, you put them in the same room and they're almost talking different languages, you know, again, I kind of say that they're watching one, looking at one screen, but seeing two different movies. Gridlock is a norm, and the election's so close, no decision is easy. You know, I do think they do get something passed, but it may not be what the market is expecting or wants, and it's definitely not a layup at this point. So I, I learned early on in my career never to bet on Washington to do the rational right thing. Um, they really don't have the same priorities as a private sector. So again, that's where my hesitant to say it's 100% slam dunk that they pass stimulus. Still the most likely outcome, but there's a chance that they don't um, before the election. Okay, thank you. And then we have another one here. Um, is the Fed purchasing high yield bonds? And if so, did this influence your decision to add them this quarter? Um, no and no. So the Fed is not purchasing high yield bonds yet. Um, I've heard discussions that they may at some point in the future, but they're not yet. What they have a mandate, and they've twisted the law on this too. So again, it, it, it's really changing language and twisting readings into it. What they can do is if a company was investment grade, which not junk, before the global finance, yeah, not the global financial crash, before the COVID, 
pandemic hit, which is March something, and I don't know the exact date, and they subsequently fall into junk category due to COVID, they can still buy that bond. So think of airlines, right? So if you're an airline, you're investment grade beforehand, but given the lack of travel, um, the debt coming due, some of the rating agencies may move you into junk status. The Fed can still buy that bond. They can't go out and buy a company that was junk beforehand, like Gap, um, like the Gap stores um, beforehand. Uh, so again, so no, they're not buying junk bonds yet, and that didn't influence. What really influenced it was just the spread. You know, we saw that chart where the spread was a little bit higher um, than it has been historically on average. So again, a little bit more income support, and you're being compensated for the risk of bankruptcies because there's always bankruptcies in high yield. There may be a little bit more, but you're being compensated. All right, thank you. And then uh, we have another one here. Um, is the NASDAQ and FMAG stocks in a bubble? Hmm. <laughs> you only know a bubble, you only know you're in a bubble after it bursts, right? Um, my opinion is yes, given that we haven't seen the economic data and the fundamentals haven't followed through yet. So the two ways that this could be resolved is we see the economy keep growing, keep expanding. Fundamentals get better, companies start earning more money, more people go back to work, and you can see where this is leading, and we get increased robust economic activity, and all those fundamentals, the denominators, catch up to the price. The other way, which is not the pretty way, is the price collapses. So once that happens and how they get resolved, then you know if you're in a bubble. I tend to think we're closer to a bubble than not, um, but again, timing a bubble is very tough. When does a bubble pop? Um, who knows? Um, I think the way to prevent getting too much risk in a bubble is to have diversification, which is why we build diversified portfolios. We have a lot of bonds. We have some high yield in there. We have some risk managed strategies. Yes, we have some exposure to FMAGs, but we're really underweight FMAGs compared to our benchmark. Um, we're more into the value stocks. Again, things that have trading at very decent fundamentals, which is really why we rely on valuation to provide a lot of support. Um, so again, I think they're in a bubble, but there's really no way of knowing to after the tell. We'll, have, we'll, let, we'll let history find out if we actually are in a bubble or not. But we're closer to a bubble than not. Okay, looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, so what happens to the market if we do get a vaccine this year? Um, takes off like a rocket um, in the short term. <laughs> there's no way fans and butts about it. Um, there's no way to predict that. Again, I know some investors try, they look to scrape headlines, but again, at least in the short term, you know, it's going to go off like a rocket because people are repositioned for increased economic recovery. But after the initial euphoria sets in and you get that big burst, you know, then you start taking a look at reality and what's the next driver of return. So again, you do may get a burst up there, but then you start thinking about all the debt about the Fed taking back a lot of the support, the government support coming off and what that does to the economy. I mean, there was a lot of permanent damage done by COVID that we just don't see yet. And we don't know the ramifications of that. So even with a virus, it, there's no, uh, yeah, even with a vaccine, there's no guarantee that we get back to a greater economic run rate given all the damage that's already been done. Um, we also have to remember the headlines about progress and the ability to deliver effective dose um, to the majority of the population are on very different timescales. So you hear there's a vaccine out there that may have some positive attributes. It's with 5,000 people and we still have six months more of testing and then six more months before it comes to market. So again, um, a vaccine would be great news for everyone. And I think we stand ready and prepared to change allocations in your portfolio if needed, if that happens. And I really do hope we have to do that very soon. I agree. Okay, I think that pretty much wraps it up here. So uh, thank you, Chris, for spending the time to putting um, all that information together for us. And thank you for everyone joining us today that you took time out of your day. Uh, the next scheduled webinar series uh, is Friday, October 23rd at 12 p.m. Uh, you can sign up now on our website or you can wait. Uh, we'll send out an, an announcement closer to that date. Uh, I hope that everyone stays healthy and we hope to see you soon. And if there's anything that you want to go over in more detail uh, with Chris, you can always call the office uh, and, and uh, or you can always send emails. Uh, so we're always here. So we, we do hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thank you, everyone.